Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce, and I am joined by not one, but three guests today from Salesforce who are going to talk to us all about the new Data Prep 3.0 that will be in open beta in the summer 20 release. So go ahead, guys. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. This is Tim Bizzold. I'm a product manager on the Einstein Analytics Data Platform, and I'm really excited to uh, present to you today our latest uh, product launch that uh, we'll ex we're really excited to, to share with you today. Hey everyone, I'm JD Vogt. I'm a VP of user experience for Einstein Analytics and Einstein Platform. Great to be here today. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Oksana Zivinska. I'm product designer on the Analytics Einstein data platform and I'm excited today to share with JD and team what we've been working on um, during the past couple of releases. So in Einstein Analytics, we have two layers. One is dashboard layer, and another one is data layer. And in order to create this dashboard, users need to manipulate data. In the Einstein Analytics, uh, in order to manipulate data, they need to go either in the data flow or in the recipe. And it's not always easy to manipulate data uh, because in the data flow, you need to know how to code, you need to know SQL, you need to know JSON. And um, we've talked to a lot of users before um, starting our new data prep next generation. And what we found that there are two types of users. Some users are visual people and another are, um, other users are tech heavy, savvy uh, data flow editors. And so for uh, those who are, are very J JSON focused and code oriented data flow and doesn't cause any troubles. But for users who are all about visuals and all about UI, this slide caused a lot of anxiety. Our problem, problem statement was how do we make life easier for users who are visual and how do we provide that powerful value of data flow for users who are data savvy and who are uh, very comfortable with JSON. And we identified three types of users, three types of personas, which is admin, analyst, and developer. The challenge we had with data flows and recipes that it took sometimes from three to six months for our users to be successful with a data flow and to be fluent in data flow. And just as GD pointed before, how do we make that experience accessible, user friendly, and how do we cut time? to maybe one, two months for our users to be successful with uh, data prep. We've done a lot of user studies. We've talked to more than 100 people. We showed our ideas. We uh, got a lot of feedback about current tools, about current use of data flows, about current use of recipes. And I think the main point we took away was that users really like seeing visual uh, live preview of their data. They really like to have user-friendly UI and they also want to have that powerful feature that Dataflow provides them with. And so taken from there, um, we've developed a use case when Nikki is an admin and she wants to develop a dashboard. Her boss asks her to help her out with the dashboard. Um, and of course she cannot say no, so she goes in developing this beautiful dashboard in the data set layer. Her problem was which tool to use, data flow or recipe. And of course, Nikki is the visual, visual person, she, so she wants that combined experience of recipe plus data flow. Because currently data flow is kind of overwhelming and recipe is nice, UI, easy to understand. And yeah, that was basically the use case for us, why we started to um, to think about new data prep generation at the first place. So the user would not be confused which path to take and how do they go to the end goal of the beautiful dashboard, but, but with li very little of the anxiety and very little of the effort. All right, Tim, you wanna show us some cool stuff? Absolutely, yeah, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, so first of all, I wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a demo um, of what's coming in the summer 
uh, release as an open beta. That means um, we, you as an administrator can, can turn on this uh, new data prep feature. Um, before we jump into data prep, just a real quick uh, recap. Um, bringing data in into the Einstein Analytics uh, data platform is, is pretty easy. We have the native connectors to, um, to a bunch of data sources, including uh, the native connection to Salesforce um, <clears throat> that I turned on for incremental um, updates. I can also create new connections here. And this is a pre-release org uh, for the spring, uh, sorry, for the summer um, to 2020 release um, that is um, about to hit your sandbox as soon. And creating connectors, you know, we're building more and more of these built-in out-of-the-box connectors, and these are come uh, included as part of your Einstein analytics growth and plus licenses. Uh, we've also added more connectivity options, for example, by natively integrating with a MuleSoft, so you can create your connections to MuleSoft if you have MuleSoft licenses right here from within Einstein Analytics. And then super exciting, we'll cover that as well in data prep. We're starting the next big chapter with output connections as well. So we're, uh, we currently have an open beta uh, in the summer release to allow you to also write data to S3 and to Snowflake. Um, so those are basically um, the first step, you know, of getting data in. And then the second one, you're, you may be all familiar with, with data flows and uh, the current recipe uh, experience. What we've built here in the beta is the option to create a recipe using um, data prep beta. And um, for that, I'm going to go ahead and create a new um, data prep recipe here. And we're presented with this. Uh, welcome, Matt. So we're kind of walking you through. We have a new graphical layout. It basically takes the best out of both worlds from data flows and, and data prep into a unified experience for our users so that we can leverage the interactions with, um, with the preview from data prep recipes with the power of the graph layout and the custom um, complex statements that Dataflow has. So we're really hoping to deliver um, kind of the, the best out of both worlds delivered on a new data platform that features uh, powerful uh, machine learning functions and, and a lot of built-in functionality. So the first step that I'm doing is I'm accessing all of these data sets and also data connections that I've defined. So I just mentioned all of the connectors that we have. I can go ahead and pick any of the connected objects um, that are in my org as input sources as well. So currently I mostly have my Salesforce objects here listed, but I also have a bunch of data sets. Um, and yesterday I found a cool data set about avocado prices that we can go and analyze um, and, and prep for us here. So the first step is creating this um, input node. That's basically, and I'm, I'm just starting out with a single, with a single data set for now. And with this input node, um, I get a preview of the of the data that's in this in this data set or in this you know Salesforce object, and I can see all of the columns with the with the um, column types. Um, the next thing is the creating a new node. So basically, I'm interacting with the graph here, and I can go ahead and create any type of node. Um, from from there on as a next step. And you'll notice that we have join and append nodes. Those are nodes where we bring in additional data either horizontally on a join or kind of vertically on the append. Um, and then aggregations filter. And then there's this transform node. Um, inside, inside this transform node, I have a bunch of functionality um, that's contained in here. So let's say I have this, I have this date field um, and I can go ahead, go ahead and uh, extract date parts. For example, if I want to group by a specific quarter um, or a specific um, set of date parts that are contained in here, um, I can I can pick my date part. And something that I wanted to point out here as well is 
um, in, if you're familiar with data prep recipes, when it created a transformation, it always created a new column and it kept the original column um, around as well. So you'd have to go back and maybe clean up the old column if you didn't want it. Here we're giving you the choice of what should happen. You know, either I create a new column and automatically drop the original, or I can even do an in-place um, replacement of the new data that results from this transformation into the original column. And I can give this new uh, column also a name, for example, date um, quarter. <clears throat> And you notice that this creates a first transformation here inside this transform. Um, we call this a, a transform step um, as well. And from there, the new field is actually currently created all the way on the right-hand side. There's some, some quirks still in the product. Um, you know, we, we want this field to be created right next to it um, in the future. So we're, we're fixing that. There's probably a couple of items where, you know, we'll, we're still working on, um, on some fine-tuning um, these elements. So if we look at this, uh, we now have year and quarter. Uh, we can also switch to the columns tab here and get a complete inventory of the columns. Um, I can also go ahead and um, maybe concatenate some of those. So I have a bunch of transforms here and our, these transforms are unique to the specific types um, that I um, that I um, selected. Um, I can go in and edit these attributes. I can go in and change the label of this field or the API name of this field. Um, I can uh, drop this column. Obviously, you know, we want to drop this from the input node in the first place, but if, I, if I'm creating a formula or something that, uh, I, can, I can go ahead and change the, the column type or, or remove fields. Um, the formula node is also something where we continue to invest quite a bit of work in, and that's where um, some of the legacy data flow pieces come into place as well. <clears throat> We're still working on making the experience <clears throat> a little bit um, more comfortable, but for now, for example, I can go in and use functions like concat and then type in my, my fields and to concatenate uh, these two fields. Um, and I'm hoping I'm getting the right syntax here. We'll see. Uh, apparently, year, um, and then open this up again. Let's see if that works. Um, so I'm basically I can create new uh, derived fields here, and then also inspect the result. Um, I may want you know to include a space or something in here as well. So, but you get the point. I can now go ahead and maybe convert that into a measure. Um, we have all of these type transforms basically going from, um, from all type of uh, field types to any other field type that we can go ahead and convert. And this is now converted um, into a measure. So you, you can tell inside this formula node, there is a, bunch of functionality both for, for measures, um, for dates, and for um, dimensions contained as part of this functionality bar that we have um, out of the box here for the transform node. And also, if you remember in Dataflow, you created a bunch of compute expressions, and it created a very long flow um, for you. And we are collapsing all of these transforms inside this transform node. So it doesn't create an endless chain of, of transformations <clears throat> on the graph. So that's um, pretty much contained. The next step then is on my, on my avocado data, maybe, so I have basically this is, this is sales data and I have a lookup data set here that allows me, if I go back, maybe, um, discard this for now. Basically, if we look at the input data, there is a region field here. And this region, it'd be nice to, to map that to, for example, the overall population of the, of the state that this region is in. So I can see how my, um, how my sales are relative to the, to the population. And for that, I'm going to bring in a data set to analyze the, 
uh, to map basically these these regions of these sales to a uh, to a state. So um, I'm creating a new join node here to bring in the state information, um, and that maps it to the region. <clears throat> and let me take a look at the preview if the if the join is working here. So I have my I now enriched all of these records with with the state information here in in this column all the way on the right, and then I can also change the different join types that I have. And that is one of the new features of the new data platform that we introduced, not just the augment operation from Betaflow, but I also have um, different join operations. I can also continue to add additional join keys here, but I'm gonna join on, on the region field. Apply this. Now that I have the region, um, maybe I should go ahead and save my flow. Um, my avocado data set. And so now that my flow is saved, by the way, you know, this mapping of, of um, regions to states, I could have done this as well here in the transform node um, by, for example, bucketing, bucketing the regions. You know, I could have created a bucket node here saying, um, this is like my New York region, and in New York, you know, I'm picking, I'm picking the values that um, map to the New York, uh, to the New York region. But I saved some time here by just creating this, uh, this lookup operation in this, um, in this. So I don't actually need this, this bucketing step inside my transform nodes. I can remove, I can remove that transformation again from my set of transformations. Um, and then once, now that I have the, the state, I can go in and maybe pull out the state population um, to map to the region. And in here, I have the population measure um, that gives me the overall um, population for, uh, for this region. And I can inspect in the preview how my data looks like at each step of the way. So that's uh, also another big benefit compared to, to data flow. When I'm, um, when I'm creating these transformations, um, I see exactly what's happening at each stage of the flow. For example, you know, now understanding that population and then a final step may be um, something as powerful as an aggregation where I take, let's say the average price for avocados by state. Now that I have the state field in here, um, I can go in and um, I'm communicating with the Salesforce data center. Um, I'm directly working in memory on these servers to produce the preview and I get an accurate average avocado price. You know, so basically if I'm, uh, California is pretty expensive overall, but you know, when it comes to avocados, I guess we are definitely you know, a more affordable state. Uh, which is which is great news for us, uh, Pete. You're you're based in New York. Yeah, Buffalo, New York. Buffalo. Um, so I think Buffalo is actually a region in there, but you know it's one of the most expensive ones. I'm afraid it's just a lot of transport, maybe. <laughs> no avocados for me. Well, also we can't grow them locally. Yeah, exactly. Um, they come from far away. Um, so the final step, really, that I'm doing is you know is an output node. I can look at my graph here as well inspected as I'm working on this, on this output node. Um, what's really mind blowing to me is that we now have two options here. We can either create an Angst Analytics data set or we can use one of our uh, currently beta output connections um, to load the data into S3, for example, and, and push the data there. Um, and so let me just create create this output data set. We're gonna fill in the API name for you if you, if you leave it blank. Um, I can go ahead and move this into an app and save my output settings, um, save the flow, and then also run it um, straight from here. Um, that's a similar experience as you're familiar with as in, in data flow editor. And now we're submitting that flow to the Moana platform. And uh, that is our 
uh, code name essentially for, for our next generation data platform. And one reason why this new next generation data platform is, is so exciting is it comes with a bunch of um, exciting features um, that allow you to do machine learning transforms as well. And that's kind of the final step that I wanted to, to show here as well is I have this data set of reviews um, about Japanese whiskeys and I can go in, ahead and perform sentiment detection on these freeform texts. This is also used for, for case classifications, for example. Um, and this sentiment can be uh, created on the review content. I can also create it on the title itself and, and um, help me kind of get a head start on possibly identifying issues with um, red customers, you know, in my, in my Salesforce service um, implementation. When I'm, when I'm doing joins and maybe not all join keys are mashing, I can also use the predict missing values transformation to possibly with a couple of predictor columns to come up with a prediction for specific values. For example, I have sales reps in a region and the sales reps are always mapped to one region and then I have a couple of empty rows where there's no sales rep. Maybe I can um, that it, um, deduce that from the region or vice versa. So that's another, that's one of the first two machine learning transforms that we're also including as part of this next generation um, data prep platform. Yeah, I, I've got a few questions at this point. I've actually been taking notes. Um, so <laughs> first, uh, now, in a, com in a traditional compute expression, let's say that in a single node, I create five fields. Um, field number five can access fields one through four within that compute. The exception being mm -hmm. uh, if you create a date field, uh, the parts of that date field will not be available until, uh, until a subsequent node. So when we're in a transformation node, uh, I was observed, I think that I'm, I'm getting this correctly, that if you create a new field in a transform node that uh, mm -hmm. we're calling this a step, it should be able to access uh, any columns created by previous steps. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So basically what I can, what I've done here is I concatenated these two, um, these two fields. Um, year and date, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But basically, I, I took these two fields together to one, uh, um, and then I converted, um, I created this uh, text field uh, dimension, and then I converted this dimension into a measure, and then I can continue to operate on that measure. For example, I can create a, another formula on, on, on that measure, um, I can take the square root, for example, you know, of this, um, of this field. So I can continue to operate on this field, um, continuing either to create new fields, like in this case, or, or you know, to even replace the old value with, uh, with a new value. Instead, um, I think that's a useful function to have if you already have a dashboard leveraging that field and you still want to transform that field without changing the code of your, the cycle of your dashboard you can do kind of an in-place transformation. And then my, uh, <clears throat> my next question is actually kind of a two-parter. So um, I observed that uh, when you select functions um, on the columns that it's pre-populating that formula for you, but I noticed also that you do have just a, a free text. So part one of the question is, uh, what is the, the syntax that we're using? Um, will there ever be support for full SACL? And um, you know, is there is there a formula editor uh, roadmap where eventually we'd be able to say this is the function I want, um, or is it just based off of these predefined ones? Yeah, absolutely. So currently, the formula I know is pretty um, is pretty bare, and we're definitely um, adding syntax highlighting, autocomplete. Um, we're we're hoping to do this um, a safe harbor statement. We're hoping to do this in the winter uh, release. Um, to enhance the formula node and and then make it much easier to to, to define these formulas uh, in terms of the syntax we do plan to support the current SACL that's supported in dataflow which is the pre-projection um, syntax of the SACL 
um, capabilities, um, and we we plan on on full backwards compatibility there, um, because eventually, the plan for this product is to go ahead and allow customers to upgrade data flows into this data prep um, platform. And for that upgrade to be possible, you know, we need to, to have this backwards compatibility to SACL. At the same time, you know, in this new world, um, we are opening ourselves up to more standards, uh, specifically SQL. And for, for SQL, we are looking at SQL support on our query engine as well as SQL support here in this, in this formula node. Um, so, so far, the syntax is relatively simple. We have a couple of functions that we're going to support also on, on the SACO side. The operators are mostly identical. Um, even when it comes to things like case statements, you know, there's no big difference between SACO and SQL. Um, but there's still some details that we are currently sorting out as we're building this, this next step of data flow parity, functional, functional parity to data flow. Um, and, and so we're trying to actually accomplish both um, the SACO compatibility as well as allowing users to use SQL in the future in, this, in these formula nodes. And just one more comment, Pete. Um, I think when you're transitioning from data flows to this next gen data prep, there's, there's a little bit of, and maybe that's something we can discuss with um, Oksana and JD as well in the next section is there's a little bit of um, transitioning happening. For example, not all of the opportunities where you used to use uh, like a compute expression are necessarily going to become a formula node here. You know, we have bucketing, we have very powerful out of the box UI transformations that capture a lot of the use cases, why people went to compute expressions, why we, people went to compute relative functions, you know. So a little bit of, you know, um, UI support is going to be there so you don't have to drop to the formula node all the time. Okay. And then uh, next question, I see some grayed out buttons at the top. Are we able to download and upload JSON for this? Like next Yeah, that's a great. Feedback? Yeah, exactly. So basically, um, let's take a look at what's on top here. Um, so we have the ability to add more data add input sources. Um, that is something where we also want to provide templates in the future. Um, basically, similar to what you have on the on Analytics Studio with our with our apps um, app templates, you know, so that we have common scenarios. For example, flattening the role hierarchy for the security predicate. That's a very common uh, occasion, you know, where we could maybe help our users get a quick start. Um, Oksana, this is. Um, do you want to do you want to jump in here on on these buttons? Yeah, sure. Um, there will be much more functionality starting from two to eight next release. Um, but we plan for the very short term. We plan to support undo redo buttons. Um, that's basically two first buttons after bringing data, and then for. Um, we also aim for upload and download JSON, um, but um, I think we we want users focus more on the UI. So we're hoping that those buttons will be not that much usable um, if we provide very usable and user friendly UI for our recipe editor. But yeah, answering your question, those two buttons will be upload and download JSON. And then also again provide us with the, with the feedback. Right, and then so on the on the um, under redo, you know, we also plan to do uh, versioning support here. So if I save that recipe, basically I have the ability to go back to a prior version. Um, and the upload download is mostly so that you can easily migrate between orgs. We we also support packaging already as part of the open beta. And then we, we've got the ability to um, also provide feedback to straight to the product team here with this uh, with this feedback button that takes you to a Salesforce survey where you can just go ahead and um, share what's on your mind and how we can improve the the product as part of the um, 
GA released um, in the future. Um, so we have upload, download, under redo, versioning, um, and obviously public APIs for, uh, for handling these recipes when it comes to say, you know, saving, uploading, running, scheduling these things. So if I go to the list view now and can refresh my list view, I can now go in and schedule my recipe that I just built um, either by, um, you know, on a time, time basis. And by the way, sub hourly scheduling here by minute is now generally available for all Einstein Analytics Plus orgs. Um, what's new for summer is also the ability to do an event-based schedule on any type of recipe, whether that's the current, um, current generation of recipes or the future generation of recipes that we're looking at here, um, to do an event-based schedule whenever the Salesforce um, connection, um, the Salesforce local connection is, is finished syncing, and we can kick off that recipe to, to run with the fresh data and tie it to the replication or the data sync schedule. And this is the first iteration of event-based scheduling. We're planning to also listen to data set updates, for example, in the future. So um, even beyond data sync, tying it to um, data sync, even just listening when a data set is being uploaded, for example, and then kick off and trigger a, a recipe run. And then, uh, so my next question was, uh, when we're talking about bucket fields, do I noticed mm -hmm. that you had a drop down that was based on values that were found within the data. Do we additionally have the ability to create um, free text bucket values? Because we sometimes run into a situation where um, we know, for example, that you know we'll eventually have records for Erie County within New York, but we don't have any in the system today. But we want to make sure that yeah. we're, we're kind of planning ahead for that. Exactly. Oops. Um, so let me define this bucket for um, for New York. Um, and yeah, so currently this is from what's currently served in the sample. We're going to make an enhancement there as well by um, in for the winter release when we plan to go GA, uh, we want to improve our our sampling to in, to include more sample rows in the in the preview um, currently it's very, it's a very limited set of rows um, but obviously you can always go in and say for new york i also want to include other <clears throat> other regions to by just typing it in but so it's a combination of being able to manually type this in and providing a better sample um, not just more rows, but also a representative sample that represents values from each of the, you know, that each of value that is found in the in the source data set. Yeah, because I can I can see that as like current state. I've I've worked really strong to lead, to convince myself to not just keep resorting to JSON. If there's a if there's a feature and a method to do it in the UI, UI I try to do it that way. And the two mm. use cases that I still commonly do this for is um, buckets, I'll usually build those um, in Excel and then just push that into you know, my compute expression. And a lot of times that's just copy and paste with case statements. The other one that I have is for you know, normalization versus denormalization, where um, right now I've got uh, something that I'm working on where I have records that have 12 date fields on them, each for a month of the year. And then I have one row of data per, per year. Uh, and I need to actually break that into one row per month. So that's the sort of thing where I'm not going to create 12 compute expressions. I'm going to create one. I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to manipulate it in a text editor in Excel and then push it back in. But I do really like that you guys have um, really tried to isolate the, the, the killer use cases where people are resorting to JSON or to SACL and tried to provide us UI functionality for that. And basically every release, you make it harder and harder for me to find value in like, oh, where's the X? What do we need an expert for? I just have, a, I have an easy button. And, and speaking of that easy button, huge quality of life improvement that, very, that, that you just kind of casually swept away. The ability to choose what app your data set will be saved to, for me, this is huge because by default, it always goes into the share folder. And what if you're creating a data set that contains potentially confidential information and you need to validate your security predicates 
even that two minute window of how long it takes me to go back to Analytics Studio and move it to a secured app is longer than I want it hanging out in the shared app. And just being able to choose the app location when creating a data set is such an amazing quality of life update. Um, and then uh, one- Yeah, one absolutely. Other, it's just, uh, the, the, I mean, the really cool part for that is when I go in and I change my data set app here, if I go into edit data set and I change the app for this data set, um, let's say this is my output data set and I just moved apps. Actually, that reference is dynamic. So in our output node, it will now also point to the new location. So it's not that it, it can't get out of sync is, is um, what I'm saying. It's pretty, that's, uh, that's the cool part that magically always points nice. no matter where the change is made. So then um, one other question I had, I didn't uh, see it, but the prediction node currently in, in Dataflow Editor, which uh, allows us to uh, mm -hmm. basically have write back functionality to our data sets when using discovery, is that here or is that just roadmapped currently? Yeah, so that is roadmap currently. Do you want me to kind of, um, basically this is captured here, first of all, you know, Obviously, this is part of a of a forward looking forward looking uh, statement. Um, as we are kind of looking at this timeline, and we are currently in the summer twenty release uh, that is being rolled out um, as we as we speak. And in that release, we are making data prep. We call it data prep 3.0, it's kind of the next generation, and, and the old recipes we call 2.0. Um, so the, that's the current release, and then looking into the winter release, that's where the Einstein discovery predictions node um, is expected to be landing as well. So that's something we, we completed planning, but obviously we haven't developed it yet. So obviously these plans can change um, anything that is past the summer 20 release. Um, and for that, we also have the export connector coming in that I, that I demoed, that I included in the demo. Another exciting feature set um, that is available via the next generation data prep is the custom fiscal calendar support. Um, so you don't have to do the fiscal custom fiscal overrides anymore for each of the dates. And then we plan to make data prep GA. So yeah, that was basically part of the win um, winter 21 release that will be available in your orgs in October, around October this year. Awesome. Then my last question, uh, I'm under the understanding that, the, or the impression that the, the, when you talk about the machine learning for an interpreting sentiment, that this is not uh, the same uh, technology behind uh, Einstein platform services for natural language processing. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you go a little bit more in depth about the distinction? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, yeah, correct. So you don't need Einstein platform licenses for that. Um, those machine learning transformations are included as part of your Einstein analytics um, growth and plus licenses. Um, it is a technology that is independent of the Einstein platform as well. So under behind the scenes, it is not the same, not the same stack. We are processing this as part of our data layer, as part of the batch processing that we're doing with um, with these recipes. So you can think of these recipes running on an entirely new distributed multi-node cluster that is also not just giving us more functionality like the machine learning capabilities. Um, for predicting missing value and detecting sentiment and possibly clustering in the future as well to do customer segmentation. Um, it also allows us to handle larger volumes of data. We've seen tremendous growth on our data platform, more than doubling the volumes year over year from, from more customers and existing customers using more of our data platform. So the new platform helps us to scale our, our um, extreme growth. It also helps our customers process more data faster. So we've seen performance improvements, especially for the very large volume jobs on this new data platform. So when you move from a data flow, and we can see this in this timeline here, starting with, and this is the further we go in the future, the more uncertain obviously it becomes, um, but starting with spring and summer, 
we're allowing customers to move from a data flow into this next generation data prep with a very similar experience with a with with functional parity essentially established data flow customers with with long running flows that are either complex or processing a lot of data will see significant performance improvements on on this new when once they upgrade because it will not just be a new tool it will also be a new underlying platform i have one slide actually that kind of shows you the the differences in so basically the machine learning the built in on the on this last line here in this in this table built in connectors the data prep ml functions that you asked Pete are included in both um license sets but with Einstein analytics plus you now get 10 billion rows out of the box uh, data flow concurrency of two, and then in the future, we're also looking at recipe concurrency and then the sub hourly scheduling that we saw on the unscheduling interface. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all about performance increases because um, I've had the snake biting its tail scenario where a data flow takes 24 hours to run and then hits up against its own schedule. Uh, it, it's right. been a couple of years. We've got that one down to six hours now. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. There's, there continues to be obviously, and, and that's where maybe the, the user experience discussion also comes in for, for recipes, you know, on how we think the developer, you know, providing adequate information to the developer when they're designing their flow to, in terms of, you know, how long did it take in the last run, for example, to process this node? Um, and how can we allow our customers identify unused fields, for example, that that are just taking up space, burning resources in there. But then, so there's a little bit of, we want to help the developers make smart decisions, but then also just process high volumes faster because we, we're not, you know, we're, we can scale it out horizontally and just partition the data out and have multiple boxes process the same thing at the same time yeah and that, that kind of optimization is something that's it's usually a lot of like sherlock holmes detective work because with that very long running data flow uh it took me a while to analyze looking at the node run times and i actually started breaking my computes out uh because i had um, a couple of large computes at the very beginning that, that would take take the longest and i wanted to know what about them was different and so I actually broke all of the note, like the, the, the fields out and created them as separate computes to see where I was getting the greatest amount of lag. And I found that um, creating date fields was much more uh, processing intensive than creating text fields or numbers. Uh, and so what I did was um, I found that a lot of times I was creating these dates because I needed them further down in the data flow. And I stopped treating them as dates and I just started treating them as numbers and just worked with the epics and didn't actually convert to a date unless I needed it exposed to the users uh, in, in the dashboard designer. And that helped significantly. But being able to find a trail of breadcrumbs that's going to take you to that sort of information can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. There's one other, one other like small quality of life thing it might be nice to touch on. And I know that a lot of users have complained about uh, they move nodes around, right? And then they come back to it and then it's all rearranged again. Our engineering team has spent a lot of time uh, working on making these nodes map well. And then when you save it and you leave uh, and come back to it, if there's not an error. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, it's, it's complaining <laughs> about the bucket field. It is, it is the bucketing and we have a bug on that file. So let me, yeah, I was able to save it. I'll go back to data manager, open this recipe up again. There it is, right? Just the way you last drew it. Oh, and it, I was, I was, as I'm watching you do that, it's like, that's got a very clean look to it. It's, I like the snap to grid. I also don't like that. It, it, it's like a couple of release about a year ago. You guys added, um, I think, no, actually, I think it was one or eighteen. Um, a feature where, when you try to close a, a browser tab that has unsaved work, it prompts you. And the reason why is because you're basically you're playing Russian roulette with your keyboard because Control E, is, which it gets us to our code editor, is directly between 
control W, which closes our tab, and control R, which reloads our tab, both of which cause you to lose any unsafe progress. Yeah. And very similarly, in current state data flow editor, if you go to open a node, like a th almost a third of that node is the trash can. <laughs> And I have deleted, I've lost so much work by accidentally deleting a node when I'm just trying to open it. Yeah, that's, that's not good. Especially if you're yeah. zooming out really far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just want to add to Pete's point that uh, before actually developing this product, we've talked to some, so many customers and we tried to hear everyone out about those trash icons which accidentally delete node and then you don't have mechanism to re redo your last actions or maybe about those um, unreadable huge amount of nodes thousands of nodes in the same canvas and you there is like no way to snap them to the grid and to remember your last settings and your last layout um, so yeah we we've spent a lot of time especially our engineering team trying to um, refine and to um, improve user experience of interacting with this canvas and you can notice all the different type nodes have different shapes colors um, in the future we want to provide uh, auto layout feature so let's say you drag nodes around and then you decided that you're not you're not happy with your auto layout so you can just click one button and it will uh, automatically magically create uh, layout for nodes with as little intersection of connectors as possible. Uh, so that's not a feature is coming. And then, um, yeah, uh, another feature we are considering to add is node descriptions. So in the future, users will be able to change their node names and add descriptions to their nodes and annotate on their canvas. Yeah, that's a, a little secret unknown feature about current state data flow editor is that um, all nodes support underscore comment, which is just a free text field that magically doesn't break your data flow. Uh, and I discovered that floating around in the sales analytics app. I think it was like version three or something. I'm like, there's comments in here. That's a great <laughs> idea. Um, but I mean, even just little things like, um, I, have you guys ever encountered the sticky node phenomena? And this might just be a Windows thing, but when you go to click and drag a node, you can't let go of it. And it's like it's stuck to your hand like flypaper, and you have to keep clicking on the node a bunch of times to get it to, to let go. And that's half the time that I ended up accidentally deleting nodes because I was like, but get it off my hand, you yeah. know? Uh, or, or like if you put, cat, like if the cat steps on a sticker, you know, it's terrible. This is, this is amazing though. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this, and I'm very much looking to get my hands into this. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So we are rolling this out to GS0 orgs uh, today. And um, so, yeah, very exciting um, release rollout. And then in terms of the graph interactions here, we've we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And um, another thing that we identified is, is multi-select and copy to clipboard as well. Right, JD? Yeah, so that's something else we'll uh, we'll be looking at in the future as well. Is how do we how do we accommodate those sorts of things? Yeah, and especially like in uh, in dashboards, for example, there isn't really a concept of copy paste as separate actions. They're combined. So when you clip a lens to a designer, it will automatically select what dashboard it wants to go to. Yeah. And so use cases you run into are, hey, I really like this chart from the sales analytics dashboard uh, from one of the, the pre-built dashboards. Maybe I really love that um, cumulative pipeline velocity one from the, leader, uh, from the leaderboard dashboard. And I want to put it on my own. So first I have to go to that one. I have to explore. Then I have to close the leaderboard dashboard, open up my custom one, and then clip to make sure it goes to the right place. Uh, or similarly, when you when you clone a, a a widget, it just automatically goes to the bottom. And like, just I, I love that you guys like really think about um, you know what is it what is it like sitting in this chair and building this stuff. And it's not just about you know can we get a product out the door. It's can we get a product out the door that our customers are actually going to be able to use and are going to like, and that's going to make them more efficient. So yeah, I think, amazing stuff, guys. I love well, thanks. Yeah, I think that was, a, that was a real challenge for us on the design team because 
we identified the problem as um, new users were coming into it. There's just a, a really steep curve to learning how the data flow manager or even recipes works. And we did find that the users who were using data flow really liked it once they, once they got the hang of it, which tended to take them about six months. Uh, we just felt that was way too long. So the goal with, with us with this redesign was like, how do we reduce the amount of time it takes for a new person to get on board and feel comfortable with it? And we wanted to get that down to as little time as possible. Um, hopefully getting some of these tools more visible, being able to see some of the results as you're putting them in that, that you can't see normally in the data flow uh, will help. Um, and giving the, and I think the, and the other kind of challenge with this was like, we want to make it easier for these people to use. We also want to provide that power that our, that our kind of core developer sort of folks have, have had as well. So it was a balance, right, of like, how do we improve the ease of use, still provide that heavy functionality that our, uh, you know, people like you, for instance, and others uh, need to be successful. You know, the, the story of Nikki that you described right there is quite literally the story of a fellow analytics champion who will remain anonymous. Uh, and she was tasked with building some dashboards. But in order to be able to do that, she had to actually build out uh, the data flow for it. And there was already a pre-existing data flow, but it was just a monster that, you know, it, a lot of it was just really old stuff that uh, a vendor had built that nobody really understood. And it was very black box. And there were several hundred nodes in this data flow. And her solution as a visual thinker who needed to be able to see this in a more a rational fashion than what she could get from the data flow editor. Well, she just went out and she got a 10 foot wide whiteboard for her home office, mounted it on the wall and mapped out every single node, color coded them all so that she could understand it in a visual sense. Um, so hopefully she has other uses for that whiteboard now. <laughs> yeah, you can, I think you can think of this as a really, uh, hopefully this new product is a love letter to those users. Um, so that they, they don't have to go out and buy whiteboards. They can see this stuff visually. They can work with it. They can interact with it uh, and see their progress. I, I also had a similar experience as we were putting this together. I took the, the existing sales app template uh, that we have that has hundreds and hundreds of nodes in it um, and mapped that to the, to the new experience. So that was eight or nine hours of just <laughs> trying to go through each node and figure out what it did and try to map to the ex new experience. I can say that it's good in that we reduced the number of nodes uh, by about a third, um, just in general, because we're able to put some of those into the, into the transform node. Um, so hopefully you can kind of name that transform node you want and keep track of the things that are in there. And then as you're trying to look at the overall graph of what's going on, you get a better sense of how the data is flowing. Um, I think there are also some horror stories of people having to like do small things and then run it really quick just to see what they got. Or having like dead end things they could they could just test some things out we wanted to make those things go away yeah like the dirty trick of appending zero 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 one to a node to try to get it to run as soon as possible and then all the prereqs that that it needs will still have to run first but it's just like how do i am i missing a comma here yeah. i don't know i feel like i'm missing a comma <laughs> i'll see you in an hour yeah yeah all right, well, I wanna thank everybody for uh, putting this together. This is amazing stuff uh, for everybody watching at home. Uh, stay safe. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching. Night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, thanks for having us.